Very good evening. You're watching India today with me, Nabila Jamal, our state of war, Karnataka. I'm bringing you the latest from the state where we're seeing all political parties today on hectic election campaign. Let me start with Rahul Gandhi. Uh, big update here as Rahul Gandhi comes out uh, in campaign in Karnataka's Belgavi. He comes out to evoke some national issues or rather bring to focus issues like price lines, inflation, GST. Rahul Gandhi for the first time evoking national issues in Karnataka's assembly campaign, slamming the central government for ignoring the plight of the farmers in fold-bound Karnataka, addressing several sugarcane farmers in Belagavi's Ramdurg area today. Rahul Gandhi said that if at all the Congress comes to power in the state of Karnataka, they will change the GST and make it simpler. Basically, he spoke about how the BJP government rolls out GST, which is complicated, no common man understands it, and the Congress government, if come to power, will change dynamics of GST. He also addressed inflation, spoke about the Adani Ambani issue, saying that many private players get their loans waived off, but poor people uh, wanting loans are not granted, and, and none of their loans are waived off. These kind of issues that Rahul Gandhi brought to the focus, um, national issues, that were almost the focal point here for Rahul Gandhi in Belagavi, in Karnataka, while he campaigned. Let's have a listen to what Rahul said. The first time, the tax on the farmers was put in Hindustan. The first time, the GST was put in the history. The GST is only for the country of the Ameer people to help the Ameer people. कि आधे लोगों को तो समझ नहीं आता ये जीएसटी कैसे भरनी है कब भरनी है चलो और जो बड़े बिजनेस होते हैं उनके पास अकाउंटेंट्स होते हैं जो छोटे बिजनेस होते हैं उनके पास अकाउंटेंट नहीं होते हैं तो छोटे बिजनेस बंद हो जाते हैं हमारी सरकार आएगी दिल्ली में तो हम इस जीएसटी को बदलेंगे एक टैक्स होगा और कम से कम टैक्स होगा ये पांच अलग अलग टैक्स ये हम बदल देंगे और जो फोकस आजकल दो तीन बड़े अरबपतियों पर है उसको वहां से उतार कर किसानों मजदूरों और छोटे व्यापारियों की ओर डालना पड़ेगा आज अरबपति बैंक से कितना भी लोन लेना चाहते हैं ले सकते हैं अदानी जी के अंबानी जी के लाखों करोड़ रुपए बैंक लोन बैंक में जाते हैं एकदम पैसा मिलता है और अगर कभी मुश्किल होती है अरबपतियों का कर्जा माफ हो जाता है मगर किसानों का लोन कभी माफ नहीं होता है राइट all right, that was Rahul Gandhi bringing the focus national issues in the state of Karnataka. Very interesting to see uh, these star campaigners for uh, uh, parties like the Congress, of course, are trying to uh, evoke issues of national significance. So the question that we now uh, are forced to ask is, is Karnataka's election stage almost a pre-decider to what comes forward in 2024? I'm right now in Bengaluru's iconic uh, structure here, Town Hall, standing in right, right in front of this place where you see all kinds of protests. Anyone wanting, wanting to protest, Town Hall is really the spot that they come by, almost celebrating a democracy in our country. This is the spot, the Town Hall, where you have people really coming out vocally expressing their opinions. Now let me cut across to all the poll campaigners. We have all the biggest uh, top stars of all political parties out on the campaign trail today. Uh, here are some of the visuals coming in from uh, Mysuru region where we saw Amit Shah, who uh, is the Home Minister and the man known closest to Prime Minister Modi who was campaigning across the old Mysuru region, very significant to Karnataka's politics, right now known as the bastion of the JDS and the Congress. Old Mysuru region seems to be the focus for the BJP now, really trying to tap into that vote bank. Uh, Amit Shah, National Party President, also JP Nadda was there. He was holding a roadshow. Amit Shah held this massive roadshow in Hassan district of Karnataka where he launched a scathing attack at the Grand Old Party, the Congress, accusing them of being corrupt. You also saw Malika Arjun Kharge, uh, the Congress President, also rolling out uh, his uh, campaign where he promised ahead of polls free electricity for the state of Karnataka, uh, some units of free electricity and monthly allowances as well. But I'm going to cut across to Amit Shah. What he spoke in, uh, in response to all the Congress's allegations, this was his exclusive interaction with India Today's Nagarjun Dwarkana. JDS family, you say to American president, Russian president, this jile ka log JDS ke saath hai. Yeh unka hankar hai. लोकतंत्र में कभी एक परिवार का शासन नहीं चल सकता 
जनता ये स्वीकार कर रही है और मुझे पूरा भरोसा है कि हासन की और कर्नाटक की जनता पूर्ण बहुमत का भारतीय जनता पार्टी का शासन लाएगी सर ओल्ड मैसूर रीजन में आपका इस बार बहुत ज्यादा कंसंट्रेशन है सर क्या एक स्ट्रैटेजी है कि हैदराबाद कर्नाटक के अलावा ओल्ड मैसूर भी आपका स्ट्रांग होल्ड है निश्चित रूप से इस बार ओल्ड मैसूर रीजन में भारतीय जनता पार्टी को बढ़िया विजय मिलेगा अभी आके मैं एक रोड शो कर कर आया इसके विजुअल देख लीजिए अगर रोड शो में पचास हजार से ज्यादा लोग अगर आते हैं तो वो सीट निश्चित रूप से हम जीतते हैं सर ऑल्सो कांग्रेस की जो नेता जो है वो वो, च, वो चैलेंज कर रहे हैं कि अगर बीजेपी के कर, बीजेपी की ताकत हो तो एक लिंगायत अगला मुख्यमंत्री बनेगा इसे डिक्लेयर करने के लिए बीजेपी का सवाल है बीजेपी का तो मुख्यमंत्री लिंगायत है ही कांग्रेस जरा घोषणा करे उनको घोषणा करनी है उन्होंने हमेशा लिंगायतों का अपमान किया है चाहे वीरप्पा मोइली हो चाहे निकलिन जगप्पा हो All right, I'm going to cut across to a very interesting story that came as a controversy ahead of Karnataka election. Now, that was the hijab controversy that really uh, grabbed global headlines just a few months earlier. There were some girls who really fought for wearing the hijab inside educational institutions. Many of them were heckled, uh, and there was a lot of pushback. The state government of Karnataka also reached the hike. They argued in the high court that hijab should not be allowed inside educational institutions. At this point, that debate still continues. While one of those girls, Tabasum Sheikh, who was uh, who was really at the forefront fighting for hijab for Muslim girls who who want to make that a choice or who want to wear it inside institutions, she went into exams right during those months of the controversy and now has come out with flying colours. Uh, this is a mention that we make here because it it appeared almost as if Tabasum had to make a choice between her faith or education. Tabasum has now uh, topped her uh, uh, her exams. This is the latest we get. She's topped her art stream in her PU examinations. Speaking exclusively to India today, she's shared her experience on what went through that uh, that period during that hijab controversy, and says that her parents completely encouraged her to pursue her uh, education despite all that that happened in the background when it came to hijab. Let's have a listen as she emphasizes that education is certainly paramount. Talking about mental health, you know, I'm sure you would have gone through a lot of challenges around the year 2020 or 2021 when the whole hijab controversy happened. So, tell us a bit about how you dealt with it. Uh, it was a period of uncertainty. I was very confused and uh, depressed because, uh, like I said. Um, uh, because the hijab is a integral part of my identity and also my religion but first it is a part of my identity right uh, it is something which i have uh, i've been wearing the hijab since i was 5 so it was very difficult for me to give it up and i didn't want to it's a secular country i should be allowed to uh, wear my hijab while i pursue my education so it felt very unfair very unjust and uh, when, when the verdict came out um, my parents they encouraged me to comply with the orders and um, like I, I did not attend college for uh, two weeks because I was very confused about what I should do. But my parents said that if I was able to acquire an education, then I could get to a position where I could prevent such injustices from happening in the future. So that was my main motive for continuing to attend college. All right, there you have it. And in some more good news, when it comes to the political scenario here, we have all the top guns out in the field campaigning. And here's some visual. I'm going to cut across to JDS Supremo, former Prime Minister of, uh, of India, H.D. Deve Gowda, after one year of illness, has now come out in full energy and strength to campaign along the Tumkuru region. This is hugely significant because he is one of the biggest players uh, in the political scenario. JDS is also known as the party to frame uh, the, the one that actually decides, the party that actually decides which government comes to power. Uh, JDS is Supremo, I see David Gowda out of the campaign trail. He was almost bedridden, let, let me repeat this, he was extremely ill, almost bedridden for a year after illness. He's now almost resurrected. He surfaced out of the campaign trail, trying to strengthen his party, the JDS, right from the grassroots. Tumkur is one of the regions that the JDS is strong, and that's where David Gowda was spotted campaigning today. Let's have a look at this snippet. Mr. 
ಕಡುಬಡತನ ಅದೆಲ್ಲವನ್ನೂ ಗೊತ್ತಿದೆ ನನಗೆ ನಾನು ಹೆಚ್ಚು ಮಾತನಾಡಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಹೋಗಲಿಲ್ಲ ಮುಸ್ಲಿಂ ಮುಖಂಡಗಳು ಇವತ್ತು ತುಂಬ ಜನ ಈ ಪಕ್ಷಕ್ಕೆ ಸೇರ್ಪಡೆ ಆಗಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅಷ್ಟೇ ಅಲ್ಲ ನಾವೆಲ್ಲರೂ ನಾನು ಹೇಳಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಆಗ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೇನೆ ದಯಮಾಡಿ ಕ್ಷಮೆ ಕೇಳ್ತೇನೆ ನಿಮ್ಮಲ್ಲಿ ನಿಮ್ಮ ಹೆಸರನ್ನು ಬರ್ಕೊಟ್ಟಿಲ್ಲ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಆದರೂ ಬೇಸರ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಳ್ಬೇಡಿ ನೀವೆಲ್ಲರೂ ನನ್ನವರೇ ಏನು ಯಾವುದೂ All right, that was Devi Kala addressing a huge gathering there. Uh, he is unable to really walk at length, but he is managing to campaign for his party, the JDS. And today it appears was a very important day because uh, let me give you a, a, a quick word on what happened in Mandya. Mandya, a very important area for the JDS. Somehow, they failed to convince the independent candidates to withdraw. Today was the last day of uh, withdrawal for nominations and the JDS failed to convince independent candidates who were part of the JDS earlier to withdraw the nomination. So, it's going to be a tough fight for the JDS, even in their stronghold, Mandya region. And at a time like this, we've seen JDS's Deve Gowda now coming out himself out on the campaign trail to campaign for his party. I'm going to cut across finally in our last leg of our segment on the first time voters in Karnataka in Bengaluru's Jain University Center for Management Studies. I spoke to some of the, some of, uh, a few very vocal opinionated students who spoke about what they want uh, to, uh, what they want uh, as a change in Karnataka, in Bengaluru city and how do they really look at connecting with the politicians and what kind of things would really motivate them to come out and vote. Here are some of those opinions from Ground Zero. Host of first-time voters in Karnataka have a lot to say and are quite opinionated before the elections in the state. Let me uh, chat with these students from the Jain University College for Management. As a citizen in general, I would like to say a stable government. Okay, uh, so something that I would want to address is congestion issues. Bangalore is the second most congested city in the entire world and I face the traffic issues on a daily basis where I take like uh, 35 minutes to cover a stretch of 5 kilometers. So, yeah. yes, that's... So, so congestion, but you know, you have, you have a small city with an influx of population. It's, it's really hard for any government to maneuver. So, I, I don't know if there is a solution around that, but yes, what, what would you like to say? I would like, means environmental issues. If you see, like, whole Bangalore is a college land of lakes. Now, in currently, I would say, like, there's no talking on this environmental issues properly. I would yeah. say, like, we have to focus. There's no discussion on environmental issues. And here we boast of Bangalore. Weather, I don't know if the weather is still the same, is it? Oh, uh, the weather is quite different because I'm not from Bangalore. I'm from Udupi, yeah. and you know, that's still from Karnataka. Yeah. Same, same, same. <laughs> but the weather change has been so much more drastic because when I first thought of coming here, everyone told me, "Oh, it's going to be beautiful. The weather's amazing. It rains all the time." And then I came here, and I'm like, "That's not happening." Manav is also an alumni, now a trainer at uh, the same college that he passed out in. Manav, what's yeah. your take? Oh, so I think 2014 was a breakthrough election because a lot of first-time voters were there. And now in 2019, we've seen a lot of dip in the first-time voters. Yeah. The 35% the the dip in exactly. uh, first-time voters yeah. compared to 2019. Yeah, compared to, Com 20 compared to 2014, yes. Right. So what's happening is, I think, uh, the educated youth, uh, now we expect you to give us a roadmap to the manifesto and not just a manifesto. You tell me how you're going to fulfill the promises rather than just promising. Right. So, so you think a manifesto is something that will lure uh, first-time voters to come out and vote? Is that right? Yeah, I also feel that because uh, as India became one of the populous country, the labor force in India will tend to increase. So I feel government would government should take initiatives to have a standardized layoff system, as in case in France we have the standoff layoff period is one to six months, whereas in India, in, in India we don't have that standardized layoff period. Mm -hmm. So I feel uh, government should take stand steps in order to improve the working condition as well as to ensure the security for the laborers. In in Somehow there's no plan that is concrete. You're, you're always making plans and scrapping it, but when it comes to actual uh, a layout of a, of a city or a state, you can't do that. It's, it's not, you're not writing it with pencil and rubbing it. With yeah, so my, I would like to bring light on the EV policies that a uh, government has brought. So there's been, there's been a significant jump in the EV registrations in Bangalore, and I just love the sound of EVs roaring around. And I believe it's really a very great initiative by the government for the environment as a whole. Oh, okay, electric vehicles. But where are the plug points? I went to a mall the other day, and it said EV station. Like they had e uh, specifically parking uh, for meant for EV vehicles. 
but they had no charging points. So it's like they are welcoming the move without actual infrastructure building. Motor was I, I only see normal gas powered cars in the EV parking spots nowadays. Gas powered. Oh yeah, that, that also. Well, I think it all boils down to very two simple points. One is about the distribution in terms of civic bodies that are present, which cause a lot of difficulties in terms of utilities that are used by the common man. Mm -hmm. Two very simple examples is one, like you mentioned, the EV sector that's already present. Two, you asked if there was a solution for this in the beginning with regards to how there is a lot of distribution. Right. Now, let's take two civic bodies, BMTC and Nama Metro. If both of them were to say work in Unision, they w we would solve half of that traffic problem that's currently present. The current ratio is one is to one in terms of the people who are present and the number of cars, the vehicles they own. You know, you, you, do you all notice wires hanging down in, uh, across <laughs> Bengaluru City? Yeah, that's because lack of coordination between the BESCOM, the BBMP and all the other actual agencies who are, who are ideally supposed to be working in tandem. Gosh, I mean, I can only imagine if, if many of these young voters are so aware of what, uh, what actually is needed for Karnataka. I wonder why politicians aren't foreseeing this or aren't prepared to resolve such issues which are so basic on ground. This time Karnataka is going to vote and issues are right in front of the Netas for them to fix. Let's see how this pans out. Right in front of the iconic uh, uh, bank here, the SBI, the Canada Bank. Along with the uh, town hall, I'm signing off here with my camera person Prashant for India Today. Thank you so much for watching.